and welcome back to another episode of the Private Practice Growth Club YouTube channel. If you're new here, I'm Tasneem Abrams, the founder of the Private Practice Growth Club. And on this channel, we share tips, tools, and tutorials for health professionals starting and growing a private practice in South Africa. If this is what interests you, please don't forget to hit the like, subscribe button, and also to hit the bell for notifications of new videos. Today, I have a guest who is a an accountant and tax practitioner. And I get lots of questions in Facebook groups and in my DMs about business structures and tax. And I get lots of one-on-one -on -one consult requests around this. I thought it would be really great to get somebody who is an actual tax practitioner to talk to us about some of the things that affect small business owners. But I think what's also important is for us to take a step back and talk a little bit about what is an accountant, what is a bookkeeper, what are some of the basic things you need to know when starting a business, which is what your small private practice is at the end of the day. So welcome, Tyra, from The Tax Geek. Thank you so much for joining me. Please just introduce yourself and tell everybody what it is you do, who you are, and all that good stuff. Thank you for having me, Tasneem. My name is Taira Meyer. I am the founder and director of The Tax Geek. I'm also a business owner, so I, um, I own a business in the automotive industry. And as a result, I use all of my experience, my failures, as well as my successes to empower and grow my clients. Um, so yeah, I'm a registered business accountant and tax practitioner. And basically, that's who I am and what I do, yes. So I think the main reason I wanted to bring you onto the channel is because I think there's a lot of confusion around, um, you know, when do you need an accountant or a bookkeeper? So can we start first with maybe just explaining to everyone what's the difference between an accountant and a bookkeeper? Okay, so basically it's not just a certificate that differentiates the two. Um, what you can, if, if I can use an analogy that um, accountants are the reporters, okay, so and the, the specialists basically, so you go to your GP and your GP checks everything out, but the GP will refer you to a specialist, which will give you more detailed um, explanation as to what the issues are or, or, you know, what you need to work on. Basically, that's how we look at it when we look at the bookkeeper versus an accountant. So bookkeepers do the day to day, you know, okay. they do the daily capturing of money in, money out. They capture and they record the payments as well as the receipts. They do invoicing, um, allocations from your suppliers, to supplier payment allocations, basically, to the client account. They also reconcile bank statements. Some bookkeepers do payroll. Um, and they can generate, bookkeepers can generate general financial, very simple reports. Okay. And these reports are your basic income statement to see whether or not you're making a profit, basically, um, as well as balance sheets. Whereas your accountant is a specialist. Okay. So your accountant is there to analyze everything that the bookkeeper has done. Your accountant is there to compile annual financial statements that is more complex. That is, um, you know, we have a certain set of guidelines that we need to work by. And so it's a more complex and detailed report compared to your normal income statement and balance sheet. You'll find that if you get a set of financials from your accountant, it will often be 12 to 20 pages long, whereas the income statement and balance sheet from your bookkeeper is one page. Um, also, your accountant should be giving you guidance and advice and support. Okay? So like I said, this is a specialist. So you should be receiving ample support, ample advice from your accountant as to what it is that you need to do legally to increase your profit, maybe increase your, your opportunities within your business and what your legal requirements are in terms of SARS, VAT, income tax, all of those type of things. So in other words, so the bookkeeper is more of an operational role. They do the day-to-day but the accountant is more than an advisor or a consultant on top of the reporting, and there should be a relationship with your accountant. 
Correct. And in, in, in a lot of cases, accounting practices offer the bookkeeping aspect of it as well. So instead of you paying for a bookkeeper, you've got an accountant which does the daily capturing, the daily reconciling and so on. Of course, you'll need to do your own invoicing. But I mean, then you've got one place that you can just streamline everything to instead of paying a bookkeeper and then also paying an accountant. It can become a bit costly to have both. Okay, so I'm glad you brought that up because when you are starting a practice or you've just started and you now want to outsource that side of things, the financial side of things, when how do you decide whether you should have a bookkeeper or whether you should have an accountant, accountant or whether you should have both? How do you make that decision? Generally, what I found is that small businesses... Unfortunately, we start off, and I say we because I am included in this, uh, we start off on the wrong footing. So we think, um, you know, we love hand to mouth, which means that we're not concerned about whether or not our books are being kept up to date, which is very mm. dangerous, a very dangerous place to start. And it's important for us to know that we at least need to do the basics. So if it is that you cannot afford an accountant or a bookkeeper, it's as simple as getting yourself a online system using Excel just to record and report everything. At which point would you need an accountant or a bookkeeper? I would say if you can afford from the beginning, that would be your best option. Um, but as business progresses, we need to start thinking about the future. And this for me is very important, and I advise all of my clients on this. We need to think about it holistically. So how will this business impact me in my personal capacity if my financials are not kept up to date right mm. so how am I going to essentially buy property get facilities from the bank how is my business going to fund further opportunities if I don't have access to those funds because my financials are not ready so when you start um, growing in your business you definitely need to make a decision as to whether you want to get a bookkeeper or an accountant. And the difference here would be looking at the cost and again, holistically, is the bookkeeper going to give me everything that I need? Everything that the bookkeeper is doing, can I essentially just do that myself and then employ an accountant um, to, to, to basically do the financials for me? And this is the thing, a lot of people get very intimidated when they're looking at financial data and having to capture that nowadays, you've got easy, simple systems that allow you to keep everything up to date without you having to have the stress. You know, in the old days, we used to write in journal books, literally books. Now you click a few buttons, you allocate a few things, and, and you've got something solid that you can give to an accountant. So uh, you mentioned, like, you know, how important it is, whether you have an accountant or a bookkeeper from the beginning or not that you do need to keep record of your financials. And that doesn't mean just having bank statements. You need to actually record your, your income, your expenses, what are assets, what are liabilities, all of those things. And you mentioned like having an Excel or there are also, of course, nowadays, all these cloud-based accounting softwares. So when you are just starting out, um, do you need to have, and you have like, or, or you've started and your, your turnover is really low. You don't have a lot of a high turnover. Um, and, you, and you don't have an, uh, a bookkeeper, an accountant. Um, do you need to have um, a, like a, an accounting software or can you get on with just using Excel? And if you are starting with just Excel, at what point is it then better to move over to a software? Like I said, we always look at things holistically and we look at things uh, in a practical manner. So if you consider capturing um, everything on, on Excel, okay, what would that mean for you? You would need to create an Excel sheet that has columns that's listing income expenses and the different expenses. You'll need to sit with your bank statement, sift through the bank statement and allocate them according to, to those expenses, right? So the time that you are taking up to sit with an Excel document is costing you more money than it would cost you to get a system. Mm. Um, there are lots of free bookkeeping and, and um, invoicing systems. 
And a lot of the invoicing systems that are free has a bookkeeping component to it. And you could literally just drop your reports. Also, some of the banks have a back end system that allows you to capture your data on the back end. So what the systems essentially does is it draws in your bank statement with all of the details, all of the amounts, and all you need to do is allocate the amounts and the detail to the specific account. So if you have money coming in from a client, you can click on the drop down. you say um, it's for Tasneem, for example. Instead of taking all of the time to sit with an Excel spreadsheet, which, which is going to drive you crazy because you're always going to feel like you're doing too much admin. And mm. at the end of the day, as an accountant to lots of small businesses, I always advise to take the easier route and the most cost-effective route. And if we amount or if we quantify the time that you are sitting doing that, it's costing you much less to just use an um, an accounting online cloud-based system, or you could even just use a free system. Hmm. Yeah, like you said, there are lots of free and those that aren't free, even on, you can get really affordable ones. And nowadays, a lot of the, for me, when I look for a, an accounting software, one of the most important features is that it must have bank feeds to South African bank accounts, because that really does save so much time that, you know, you just open your accounting software and there all your things are there. You just have to check it and all of that. But also, like you mentioned, um, you know, the of course, it's a good start to at least start recording. If you only have like two transactions in the whole month, then fine, use your Excel sheet. But of course, as things get complicated when you buy assets and when you um, have different types of revenue streams or you want to have some sort of reporting that says, okay, you know, this percentage of your revenue comes from assessments and that percentage of your revenue comes from treatments or that percentage of your treatments are groups versus individual therapy so that you can make decisions, strategic decisions in your business then it's a bit difficult to do that when you are trying to record everything in Excel compared to a system that is already set up to, you know, categorize different types of revenue and things like that. But then the question is that if you do decide to have a bookkeeper and an accountant from the beginning and you now decide you, you, um, would, you would you say it's better to have your own sign up your for your own accounting software or is it better because I know a lot of bookkeepers um, have their own you know license to use for multiple accounts so is it better to have your own software account um, or is it and then invite your accountant or your bookkeeper in as a user and have access to your to your software or is it better to have them just do everything on their platform so that you save the cost on the subscription i think that this is um you know each to their own when it especially when it comes to this one to me as an accountant it is important for me to educate my clients so i've got lots of clients that says to me taira no ways just capture everything do everything send me a report send it to SARS, keep it up to date i don't care just do it and i've got some clients that can't afford me to do that you know they mm -hmm. can't afford for me to do that every month so um and also to me it's about educating the client so it is better in my opinion for the client to have a base where they can go onto the cloud um in my practice i personally give training to all of my clients that that opt to use a cloud-based system and I've got access to all of the cloud-based systems. So it's just a matter of me being loaded as the accountant and then getting access to the, to the system. Um, because it's important that we educate ourselves as well. It's not just about which report is better or, or you know, which way is better to go. At the end of the day, if you have an accountant that is supporting you, that wants you to grow, that wants to save on your cost, it would be better to say, listen, could you please train me? Or perhaps you could go for a, a course on how to use your, your specific uh, chosen system. If it is that you are somebody that no, you do not have the time, and again, is it going to cost you more to just sit and do all of your capturing on the system? 
if you know that you don't have the time and if you know that you're going to lag behind, then it's better to have your accountant handle everything and maybe then just send you the reports at the end of the month. It all depends on the business and what type of business we're dealing with and also the affordability of that business and whether or not the owner of that business wants to be educated in that department. I also mm. always tell my client, what happens if I get knocked over by a bus tomorrow? What are you going to do? Mm. I need to make sure that if anything should happen to me tomorrow, you at least have some sort of knowledge that will carry you through at least a month or two until you know you find someone else or my practice is up and running again. Those are things that we need to consider in business. So um, like I said, each to their own. I prefer to educate my clients along the way and assist them with loading themselves onto the platform, setting up accounts, explaining how it works, and then taking over. But like I said, some clients, they don't want me to do that, and I'm happy to do everything from the beginning to the end. So my personal experience is that I had an accountant um, when I started my digital marketing business um, more than six years ago, and I... I had an accountant from the beginning because I knew how important it was, but um, I wasn't then happy with that. I didn't have that relationship. Like she didn't advise me. She didn't or anything like that. So I changed accountants and it was very helpful to have had my own accounting system when I then changed accountants because it was just a matter of ending the contract, removing her access and giving the new accountant access. So I think also besides that something might happen to the accountant, also just as a business owner, even if you don't have to wear all the hats, you still are accountable for everything in your business. So you need to have control over everything. Correct. So um, I think also for me personally, it's just a matter of sense of control. Even if I have my accountant do all the reconciling and all of that stuff, I still like to be able to log, log into my accounting system and check what's been happening there um, and not have to also wait if I add a new re revenue stream and I want to have a category of like speaking engagements to be able to just go in there and add the account and not have to like email somebody and wait for them to do it. Um, so, yeah, so for me personally, I think it's best to have your own accounting software and then just decide to invite somebody in. Also, like there are lots of private practices who do expand and grow really quickly and end up having a practice manager who can double up as doing the bookkeeping function. And so then it would be easy to, you know, add them into the system and, and then you just have. Hmm? Yeah, sorry to break your word. You know, what also happens is that as the accountants, we don't do invoicing. We don't do GRNs, we don't do purchase orders. We basically, or even your bookkeeper, if you are outsourcing your bookkeeping, the bookkeeper generally doesn't do those type of things. Mm. So what happens is the client is sending invoices from Excel, trying to keep record of those invoices, trying to keep record of who must still pay them, trying to keep record of, like you say, which... Um, um, revenue source the invoice is coming from. And at the end of the day, the client still has more stress than if they had their own system. Mm. And what also happens is we find duplication of work now because now the client's got a, a, a invoicing system that allows you to allocate a payment from a client so that you can send a statement and that's where it ends. So what happens then is that client's already done all that work. And the accountant basically needs to reconcile all that work again, mm. um, as opposed to using an online system where you do your invoicing, you allocate the payment, you allocate your expenses, because I'm sure most small businesses doesn't really have 10,000 expenses to allocate, and then giving your accountant access to then finalize and you know do the reports and so on. And like you said, everybody wants instant access to the information that they need. If I mm. asked you, um, if I was your banker and I said to you, listen, what is your turnover? Because you're applying for a facility. You now need to get hold of Taira that is in another meeting. So you need to wait until 
she's done in her meeting or she's sitting at SARS, so she's going to be there all day. So you must wait until tonight to tell your banker what your turnover is. Mm. You see, so it, it, it definitely is a matter of looking at the bigger picture and the entire business and the holistic. Essentially, how does it affect you? How does it affect the business? Yeah. So now there's another issue. I recently uploaded a video. And for those of you who are interested in that video, I'll post a link up in the corner of this video um, on what the difference is between practice management software and accounting software. And essentially, a practice management software is a invoicing software, but it is specialized to the medical profession, particularly if you are someone who claims directly from medical aids. Because a lot of practice management softwares also have a switching functionality. So either if it doesn't have an automatic switching facility, um, the invoice it automatically, once you've created the invoice, it, it gets emailed to the relevant medical aid, which you've now already loaded the patient's details and whatever. And then the medical aid reimburses you. But if it has a switching facility, it goes through some switching where you get paid immediately. So it doesn't get emailed. It gets processed immediately on the medical aid side. So obviously, if you're a medical aid practice, it's quite important to have a good practice management software. And of course, practice management software, because they are specialized in medical practices, they've got all the ICD-10 diagnostic codes loaded in already and usually in setup depending on your profession, they'll load your treatment codes that you need. So as OTs, we have the 6-6 six, six codes. So they'll load everything. And so it's easy for you to use. The problem is practice management softwares are not accounting softwares. And a lot of practice owners are confused by that. They think that that is what it is. But it's purely an invoicing software and a client management software. So you can do account, you can do notes and some of them offer like note taking and like appointments and that, but there's no accounting function in there aside from the report that they give you in terms of how many patients you invoiced and how many are owing you. That's it. There's no place to capture expenses or purchases or anything like that. So the problem is if you do need a practice management software, you are going to have that duplication because now you, um, okay, like, so for example, if you use, um, if you use something like Payfast or whatever that integrates with your accounting software, then yes, it will automatically appear. But generally speaking, if you're going to invoice in your practice management software um, and you get a payment, because what often happens is maybe there's a co-payment. So the patient um, medical aid doesn't cover the full amount and now they have to still owe you an extra amount. Now they come in and they pay with the card or they pay by EFT that you now have to capture from your um, the same patient information you have in your practice management software. You now have to capture it in your accounting software. And so it it can become quite messy. So I don't know what you would recommend from your clients who have maybe, you know, a lot of people when they start a business, they, they start with these free invoicing apps. So it's not an accounting, but it's like an invoicing service. And now they now move over to an accounting software, but they're still using this like invoicing app. Like what do you recommend in terms of a process to make that like a smooth and um, less, not as tedious with double, double work of having to still capture income you're getting in and allocated to a specific like client when you have two separate systems that you you're not using your accounting software as your billing invoicing system you're using a separate invoicing system okay so so the practice that we need to use in accounting um, and bookkeeping is that the invoice needs to be accounted for at the time of the service okay mm -hmm. So the challenge is that some people work directly off bank statements, which means that the invoice might have been captured or the service might have been rendered two months prior and they're only receiving the payment two months later. Mm. Okay, So that can become tricky when we are reporting um, just after the end of financial year. So, for example, you run until February, and it's your end of financial year, but we we capturing everything until the end of February. But you've still got, you've got invoices that was captured, but you don't have payments in. It hasn't been paid yet. 
Okay. Mm. So it's important that your system and your reports reflect the correct income amount, especially for SARS. It needs to reflect the correct income amount based on your invoices in that specific period. Okay. So that said, the process that we generally use when clients have their own invoicing system, which is different to our reporting system, is that the client then gives us access to the invoicing system. Or they have to send us a report of the invoices that has been captured. Okay. So okay. then we will then tie up that income. We will then basically dump that income amount into your sales amount in your, in, in your accounting software. And then we will allocate the payment that is. So if it's, for example, discovery. So you've invoiced discovery this week for five clients and discovery paid 90% of that amount. Okay, so we have an account on your on your accounting system that says discovery is the client. Okay. Right? And discovery has paid you X amount, which covers 90% of the invoice total that you have sent to them. So the other 10% is then payable by discovery's client. And when okay. that client pays you, that will be allocated to Discovery's client uh, statement. Alternatively, what you could do is you obviously don't want to duplicate client information in mm. both systems. Yes. So if you know that Tasneem has a co-payment, you could just load Tasneem as a client in your accounting software and you will then be able to send her a statement or or uh, an invoice with the updated amount. I think I think every practice is different because like you said, some of some practitioners work solely with medical aids and some practitioners work with both per, uh, client directly and with the medical aid and receive payments from both ends. So the best way to do it would be to try and move things in bulk. Hmm. Hmm. And then allocate according to, you know, whether it's for the client or for the medical aid. I've got a client that does, um, it's a plumbing service and they service discovery insurance. Okay. So they also have a situation where they invoicing, but it's the or co-payments due from the, you know, excess um, mm. amounts, that is, excess amounts that is due from the client. Mm. And that's also how we manage we manage that process because otherwise you'll be lost as to how which client still owes you money, who you need to still collect from. Yeah, so because the other thing is when you're using a practice management software, it already provides you the reports in terms of the clients, like who, who owes 30 days, 60 days, and you can send them statements straight from your practice management software. So what I'm hearing you say is that in your accounting software, you don't necessarily need to... Um, specify who the clients you could even not even say the client's name you could say um that it comes that it's a, a client like to have an account that that's called maybe co-payments because yes. in your practice management software it would be alloc who who paid that co-payment will be all there in full reporting the main thing is your accounting software doesn't care the name of the client necessarily they just want to know your accounting reporting is just about this is how much you invoice this is how much is owing to you. This is how much came in. This is how much went out. This is what you bought. This is what you sold. That's it. They don't really care about the name of the client. Am I correct? Yes. So, so for an ink and for a sole prop and for actually all companies, the record keeping is important. So it's mm. important for you to hang on to what whatever you've inserted in your in your management um, practice management software, right? Mm. But when it comes to reporting from an accountant, we mm. don't say on our reports, oh, it's T. Abrams, it's T. Mayer, mm. it's mm. John Doe, whatever. We just say this is the amount that is owing yeah. to the business. This is the amount owing to suppliers. Yeah. Um, but it's important for you then to still hang on to that information in case you need to be audited Yes, by SARS yeah. or any other um, external yeah. body. But in terms of re accounting reporting, yeah. the accounting system doesn't care who owes you the money as long as yeah. you know, you know, um, yeah. as long as the reports are accurate. 
So what you're saying is just like giving me light bulbs here because it's, it's just occurring to me also that um, there is this advantage then of having in your accounting system instead of recapturing all your client information because also then you can limit what information your accountant and bookkeeper has to your patients because obviously that's it's allowed because that's a service provider that's allowed but you don't that if you can avoid them having to see like who your patients are and that because in health data that's sensitive health data but besides that if you then do what you suggest suggesting of rather having accounts that are named according to the medical aids that can give you so much amazing insight into like having a report of saying which are the medical aids that you tend to get the most and which are the medical aids that tend to have the most like where they need co-payments attached to it. And exactly. then, and which are the, so it would, can give you really great business insights um, where you can make the decisions about, okay, then given that most of your patients seem to be discovery patients and they seem to pay the bulk of the amount, maybe I should just charge discovery rates, um, you know, and make it simple. Because some practices charges, <coughs> excuse me, all the discovery, all the medical aid rates, so depending on which uh, medical aid you're on, they'll charge that medical aid rate so that they can get like 100% of the payment. Whereas others will charge only a particular medical aids rate. And then if another medical aid rate is less or more, then they they will have a shortfall there. So having in your accounting system that category, because in your practice management software, you will be already be able to run reports per client, as in your patients. So you could use this system to run more from on a higher level, making business decisions around what rates you charge and, you know, um, also cash flow, making, having an idea of what your cash flow is, because if you know, if you can then see a trend that, um, you know, this med scheme tends to pay within 15 days, whereas Bonitas pays in five days, then you can also then see and project what your cash flow is based on what your patient's medical aid is. So that's like actually quite an amazing thing to realize that you can then make decisions based on, on that rather than just, you know, what invoices is coming in. It gives you a far more in-depth understanding of your business and your business numbers. And also, um, I'm glad you're mentioning that because, again, it goes back to we need to accountants and the accounting process should essentially educate us at the end of the day. It's about analyzing data. It's not about capturing data. Okay, that's capturing data is for the bookkeeper and the bookkeeping end. Whereas accounting reports should give you insight on your business and allow you to make decisions. This is why the banks and all the the lending facilities are they are basing the decisions on the financials received from an accountant because that financials is giving them insight of the business. So also the other thing you would be able to do on your accounting system that you, I'm not sure if it's available on, on your other system, is that we would like to see costing. We'd like to see what it's actually costing us to render our service and in the you know in the manufacturing and retail um, sectors that is very important whereas if you're going to just nilly dilly do things without utilizing that software essentially you're going to be stagnant you will mm. you will basically stagnate all the time you will just be sitting on a platform and you, you won't understand why it is that you're not moving because you don't have all the insight. Mm. And then there's another aspect, of course, is that if you then decide to expand and employ people. Um, so if you don't have an accounting software, how do people then manage payroll? So um, whether you have a local or permanent employee, you still have to capture that somehow. And a practice management doesn't have any facility to uh, manage payroll. So what are your thoughts on that? Like, 
yes, we're saying that it's important, but there are so many practices who have been practicing for years and they still stick with their Excel sheet, but they have locums and things. So I'm just, I'm struggling to understand how do they then keep track of that? Because that's also important in terms of um, Department of Labor and SARS and all of that. So what, what are the minimum requirements from a business when they have, staff even if it's contract staff or locums or things like that so the minimum required for a business is to keep record is to provide the the employee with a payslip and is to provide SARS with that data to submit the uif and the pay as you earn and pay that over or stl if that is a requirement of the business you'll be surprised how many businesses still use excel mm -hmm. which I kind of understand as well because payroll systems are not as cost effective as accounting systems, surprisingly enough. Some mm -hmm. payroll systems charge you per payslip that you generate. Okay. Sure. So I've got lots of clients that still use Excel when they come, uh, when they join my practice. Of course, part of our services is that we do the payroll as well, and it's included in the cost to the client. But it's a cost-effective way for them to do it as long as they're holding on to the records and the records are accurate. So I'm not sure if you know, but in uh, 20 in last year, last of last year, the UIF um, amount increased, the threshold increased. So a lot of people was not aware of this, and everybody was still deducting UIF based on the previous threshold. So that is why it's important. If you're going to use Excel, please make sure that you are educated in knowing what it is that you need to deduct from your employees. Um, so many times we come across uh, cases where the employee approaches us and says, I think my employer messed up my pay slips. They didn't tax me correctly. Um, my UIF is not paid over. I can't take maternity benefits from the department. So it's important that if you're going to opt for the cheaper route, that it's an educated decision and that mm. you know that the values and the totals are correct. So the yeah. other thing I wanted to ask, because... So first of all, a lot of practices um, pay the locums or the staff on commission, which actually is not allowed by the HPCSA, but they do it because obviously it's easier for them to, um, you know, ma manage manage the, the cash flow because it's more, you know, they, it's, they have more control in terms of what they keep because if they don't have clients and they... Don't pay the person, right? But technically, it's not allowed. But anyway, be that as they may, a lot of them do pay the employee's commission. So how does that work then in terms of payroll and recording what you pay and issuing pay slips? And are there specific like rules and laws around um, yeah, the accounting side of, of recording that type of payments? The... Employee cost or the salaries expense would be the same. It would be recorded the same in your accounting systems. It would be recorded the same for reporting purposes. The only legal requirement that you would need to consider is the tax on that. So essentially, what we do when we're calculating tax on a salary is we're taking that salary for that specific month, multiplying it by 12, getting the taxable amount, less the rebates and all of those things, and then dividing the taxable the tax amount by 12 to get what tax we need to deduct for that month. So the challenge comes when we pay in commission and we don't know what next month's commission is going to be. So we're basing this month's tax, tax deduction based on that, for example, 10,000 rand for 12 months. And then next month, you've got 12,000 rand, and then we base our tax deduction on the 12,000 rand. So a lot of commission earners, they have directives, and they have a set amount that we deduct from them every month, regardless of what the commission is. So if you can okay. put your headspace in, for example, um, uh, property management or property um, agents that resell houses, 
there's no way for us to forecast what the commission's going to be for this month mm. versus next month. So they have a set a percentage and they get a directive from SARS to say that this is the percentage you will deduct every month. So in terms of recording and reporting, it's ex exactly the same as any other salary. It's just that we need to be, again, educated on what it is that we're deducting from that employee. But of course, that is assuming that you are, have a have the person as an employee and you are deducting UIF. So what a lot of practices do is that they say that they are employing a locum so that the, the person is then not technically an employee. They are locum tenants, which they are actually incorrectly using the term locum because according to the HPCSA, a locum tenants means in place of. So you can't have um, somebody working at the same time of, as you in the practice and you're both seeing patients and you say that's a locum. Technically, that's not a locum. Or if you have another employee in your business and that person goes off, then you can get a locum in. But what most practices are doing is they are getting somebody who is actually another person in their practice and they're calling that person a locum. And then the, what they do is they have this locum come in as and when they need them because they have a lot of patients booked for tomorrow and they can't see all those patients, so they get the locum in on that day. The person comes, because they are coming in as, as needed, and then they employ this person for like a whole year, so they, get, they don't treat them as an employee, so they don't pay UIF or anything like that. But the law says that if you employ the person for more than six months and they're working for more than a certain amount of hours and technically they're not actually a locum tenants, then they should be, you know, employed as an, as an employee. But what a lot of these practices are doing, then they're not actually then paying the tax, right? So how does that then work? So they're paying the person just on a commission of what is being invoiced or they're paying them for the day or for per session, um, but that's it. So then do they record that as a salary or do they record that as a contractor? How, how do they record that? Okay. So if let me put you in the space of um, construction industry. Okay. Okay. You are a construction, um, you've got a construction company. You employ subcontractors, right? Hmm. So the subcontractor, it can be one man coming to do painting, but you hmm. are putting him on your books as a subcontractor, which means okay. that his expense is listed as a subcontractor, which essentially then is a cost of sale, right, okay. uh, For in that industry. Um, the same thing can be done in any other industry. However, the person who you are, whom you are employing needs to then understand that they are liable for their own tax. It mm. is illegal to employ somebody, like you said, that is working for you for a certain period of time that is clearly employed by you in your business. They don't have any other work. It is illegal to not deduct the UIF. And... Um, the tax implication will always fall on the individual. And that is the scary part because, like I said, people are not always educated in what is supposed to, you know, be done for them. Mm. So at the end of the financial year, at the end of the tax year, that individual will then have to declare that income to SARS and say, I have received 120,000 Rand for the year. And they will then be liable to pay saws that lump sum amount mm. it's a very it doesn't even make sense to me why people are doing it that way because the cost to the company is exactly the same mm. because if the employee is receiving 10,000 rand whether you're paying them a full 10,000 rand or whether you're paying 10,000 rand at x amount to saws and x amount for you if you st it's still costing you 10,000 rand the yeah. only thing that you're doing is an injustice to that individual mm -hmm. um yeah. so and we find this in in a lot of businesses not just practices not just uh, construction businesses we find it in, in lots of businesses. We even sometimes restaurants are saying to me, 
can I just put my employee on as um, like a contractor or, you know, and mm. at the end of the day, what damage are you doing to that individual? And essentially you're being dishonest in your business. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So there so, are always ways around it, but it's not always the best option for your business. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the next thing that I want to lead into with that uh, um, is around the difference then between being a sole prop and a registered company. Um, yeah. Because obviously um, there's lots of implications in terms of tax, in terms of the cost of maintaining the business registration versus a sole prop. Um, and then also in terms of the responsibilities of the company versus yourself personally in relation to employees. So can we talk a little bit about that? How do you decide whether it's better to be a sole prop versus a registered company? Okay. So I can only use my personal experience as an example. Um, the tax geek has always been Tahira Maya trading as the tax geek. So I've always traded as a sole prop. Regardless of how many clients I had, it was just easier for me to, to do the hand to mouse thing. It was just less of a hassle in my mind, in you know. Um, and it's not because I'm not educated as to what the pros and cons are. It's just that I also think that there was a little bit of fear around registering a business like this. There's a very big difference between a service-rendered business and a retail business. So my battery fitment shops was registered from day one. There was no option about it. But my personal um, business or my services was not registered from day one. And it was all good and well. Um, the tax calculations was very complicated because there are only certain amount of expenses that I could um Add to my tax calculations. There were only certain amount of expenses that I could deduct from my tax calculations, and that made it very complicated. Also, when I did my tax submissions to SARS as a sole prop, I was always audited. And if you ask me to find a slip from 2021, Feb, March, for fuel that I put in, I mean, I'm going to have to look through one of my 10,000 bags for it. You understand? Mm -hmm. That is a situation that most um, soul props find themselves in. Mm -hmm. And the very challenge, it, it became very challenging for me and most challenging when I needed to buy property. I, it was impossible. It was, it was, I eventually got the property, but I never received a 100% bond. And this is something that I always use to guide and educate my clients is my personal experience with this. So as a sole prop, I think also besides the fact that people think it's easier, it's not actually easier. It's far easier to have a registered business. Pay yourself a salary and do what you want to with your salary as mm -hmm. opposed to having your personal bank account with all of the income going in, all of your personal and business expenses going out. When you go to an accountant, they're going to ask you, where am I supposed to allocate your trip to Paris to? Mm -hmm. It was a personal expense. And you will now try and convince that accountant, oh, no, but you can, you know, get the deduction because I also went for business. And, you know, it complicates things just too much. Mm -hmm. When it comes to your legal obligations, and also the value that you're putting into your business. So as a sole prop, the tax geek, Tahira Maya trading as the tax geek. If I say to you, Tasneem, I'd like to sell you my business. What am I selling to you? Hmm. I can't sell myself to you. You understand? Whereas if my business is registered, there's a set of financials, there's actual books. Yes, I could probably sell you my client, my books, my, my client uh, profiles. But that's not going to be as valuable as me selling you an entire business. Hmm. When it comes to um, an incorporated and a PTY limited private company, 
you've got the same legal requirements. You still have to register with CIPC. You have to do all of the same things in your MOI, um, your memorandum of incorporation. You have to list all of the um, the directors or the members of the incorporation. The only difference is with an incorporated is that you everybody that is a member of that incorporated is legally liable for any debt that has been made within that incorporation, right? So whereas with a PTY Limited, a PTY Limited is considered to be a separate legal person or a legal entity on its own. So it's very difficult for creditors to come after the director of a PTY, whereas an incorporated, you are directly linked to that business. So with the PTY, what they do is the creditors will often make the director sign surety mm. for whatever facilities they are using. So that way they've got, you know, they can now come after the director. Also, the other thing. Well, I mean, that is that is why as the, as health professionals, we are not allowed to be PTY limited for our clinical practice. We can have a PTY limited as a utility company to run all the non-clinical aspects like that's where you pay your rent. That's where you employ your reception staff and all of that stuff. But anything that is directly related to clinical services, so employing other therapists or um, seeing actual patients and receiving money, that cannot fall under the books of the PTY. So if you are registering a company, then going the registered company route, then it has to be an ink. Um, and I suppose that is why. That, that is why because ethically, as health professionals, we must be able to be held liable for activities of the business. We cannot say hide behind the corporate veil and say, it's my business, you can sue my business, but not me. Because I, as an occupational therapist, am responsible for the treatment that I provide my patients. Of course, yes. Um, and the other, the other thing that I've also realized is the mentality of the entrepreneur. So it's the same like getting married, right? So the person is the same. The You would think that you're just getting married. It's just a legal document. It's just a ceremony, right? But the relationship changes because the mentality changes for some reason. I'm not a psychologist. I don't know why. But it's the same thing. The mentality changes from when you are so prop and you're living hand to mouth and you are hustling. Yeah. versus when you are a registered business. This is my business. I am employed by my business. Mm -hmm. I'm a director of that business. It feels like, it feels, and again, from my personal experience with my other business, it kind of feels like there's an additional um, sense of responsibility because you now need to see to this child that is your business and make sure mm. that that business thrives and prospers and g goes to the next level and so on. Mm. It's, I've, I think that a lot of my experience with a lot of my clients was, has always been when there's a mentality shift or when there's a shift in um, just simple things. For example, moving on to an accounting system is a shift. Mm. It gives you a, a different shift in your mind as to your responsibility. Moving to a from your home office space to a office space in an office park, there's a shift. Yeah. And 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 the same with registering a business, there's an immediate shift and there's an immediate sense of, you know, my responsibility is more. So you're pushing harder because you need to make sure that this company grows and you need to make sure that this company can afford to pay your salary. It's, it's mm. amazing what entrepreneurs need to mentally go through to get to the space where they need to be. And I always say that every single person that has a business has started where most of us are or where most of us has been. There's not one business that, oh, um, let's, let's do this. Let's run a multi-million rand business without going through these teething phases. Yeah. Um, and I, I always make, um, you know, reference to big corporate companies. All of them had to start with a baseline. Mm. I guess what you're saying is it's the thing of formalizing the business. But then even as a sole prop, if you decide to stay a sole prop, there are still things you can do 
to formalize it for your own mental, you know, your own mindset. So like you were explaining, you know, it becomes so complicated when everything is running out of your account. So if you decide to start a sole prop, have a separate bank, business bank account, and then pay yourself a salary still, even though technically it's not a salary, but in your mind, if you're paying yourself a salary, you're separating your personal spending from your business spending. So if you know that, okay, the the Wi-Fi in my home office I use for a business expense because I treat patients online or whatever. So I'm going to actually sign up to the Wi-Fi company using my practice name, that's name Abrams Occupational Therapist, and it will come off my business bank account. Yes. It will be easier to explain to your accountant why that's a business expense as opposed to it comes off your personal account because everything's in your personal account, but you're also running using this Wi-Fi at home. So how do you, you know, justify that yeah. this is a business account? But just find having that formal separation, even though you are your business. But I'm also glad you brought up the thing about the selling, buying and selling of your business. There's been a lot of questions around that and it's quite concerning because in the health practice space, um, it's not as like open and, you know, um, regulated or there's no market related thing that you can look at to say, this is how you buy and sell a practice. And when you look at how much people are buying and selling practices for, the amounts are so variable, which it should be. But when you look at two businesses, practices that are more or less the same, within that even the the variability is alarming because there's a lot of practices who are selling their sole prop practices. And when you look at how they've come up with that valuation, it's absurd because like you say, you can't sell yourself if you are the practice. And so all the assets and all the liabilities is in your name, in your personal capacity, How can you sell those assets when those assets aren't up for sale? It's not part of the practice. It's your personal assets. So unless you are... um, Including the assets. Yes, exactly. And then, so, uh, you know, there's a... I think what what is important then, it sounds like what you're saying is that when you start a business, you also already have to have your exit strategy in mind. Is your intention to always just be you as a small practice owner because you want to have the flexibility to be able to take off when you want and you're not looking to build a huge practice. You just want to be able to live hand to mouth with what you what you earn, have a comfortable lifestyle, and at the end, just close your practice. Or are you looking to grow a practice that you can earn a decent salary, employ other people, grow a brand, and at the end, you're either going to sell the practice, um, yeah, that you're going to sell the practice. That's how you envision how you're going to exit the practice. Are you trying to build an asset or are you just trying to employ yourself on a day-to-day basis? And I think if you make that decision right at the start, if you decide that you are trying to build an asset or a wealth generation tool that you eventually will sell off, you have to have it as a business, as an as a registered company. You can't then stay as a sole prop. Um, and I think that that's not often what people think in the beginning is how do I intend to exit? You just think of how do I intend to enter, not how do I intend to yeah, exit. Yeah, how am I gonna make how am I going to make the money? And I think in the beginning you 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 I think a lot of businesses in all sectors you go in with the intention of I need to feed my children, I need mm. to keep a roof over our head. There is no, um, there's, there's very few businesses that start out with a plan in mind. Mm. You know, there's no, there's, there's oftentimes no plan of um, this year I'm going to focus on patients, speech therapy. Next year I want to focus on expanding that to um, clinical psychology or whatever. I don't know what the terms are, but I mean, there's no expansion plan and because of that you're always kind of limiting yourself to what could happen and then the next thing comes and then you just have to adjust your life to that thing so 
it's easier to just start from the beginning mm. the way that it's going to, you know, that it can continue that way. Also to take into account is, and maybe this is the reason why you're seeing so many variable um, costs on, on the sale of, of practices, is that one of the things that we take into consideration for a resale of a business and the valuation for that business is the goodwill. And this is also yes, this comes up a lot. Thing. Yeah, goodwill comes up a lot, and uh, and and sometimes the amount that people are charging for the goodwill. So, so, can you explain to us about that? What is goodwill, and how do you but, how is it actually calculated? So, so goodwill is essentially the brand. So, I've got um, the tax geek, and people come to the tax geek because they've got a good experience with the tax geek, and the tax geek has built over this. They've built this brand over this period of time. Okay, so for a sole prop to add goodwill to the valuation, remember a sole prop meaning Tasnim Abrams. You adding goodwill to your valuation of your of your business, which essentially means that if you're not there, then what happens to that goodwill? Hmm. I mean, if I take it from personal experience, and this is just now, you know, just thinking you know, light bulbs is also going off. If I go to the dentist, for example, I go to a specific dentist every time. If the dentist is not there. I'm not going to sit and wait for the locum. So if that dentist sells a practice to another dentist, how can you attach goodwill to that business if the goodwill is actually attached to the practitioner themselves? Mm, mm. And I can imagine that in the medical and um, in the medical field, that's probably something that must be a real big challenge because if I'm going to Dr. XYZ, and Dr. XYZ now sells these business to Dr. ABC, I'm going to go follow Dr. XYZ wherever he's going. And if he's retiring, I'm just going to go find the other doctor. Mm, mm. So goodwill essentially is, it's a, it's an, it's an, it's, it's, it's something that you can't see. Mm. And people place value to that based on the time period that you've been in business, the amount of clients that you have, the way that the business is branded and marketed and all of those things. But there's a difference between adding goodwill to spur and adding goodwill to your doctor. Yeah. Like, how do you... Yeah, and I read somewhere that, you know, um, when you're looking at goodwill, it's not enough to say, okay, I've built this reputation of and have referrals from all these doctors. You And this is where I think people don't realize how the importance of having a marketing strategy goes beyond just getting clients in your business today. That you also have to look at, does this marketing strategy have, um, can it stand the test of time? So if I take over your practice today, is there a marketing strategy in place that's already going to, that's already running and can bring new patients in like over the next few months as I take over? That would yeah. have a value to it. Or is my referrals coming from doctors who are also, say I'm retiring and I'm selling my practice and the doctors that I have a relationship, we all started around the same time. They also all going to retire now. So now I can't say that the goodwill of my practice is my relationship with these referrers because they're also going to close their practices soon. So actually that (laughs) referral source is going to dry up within the next year. Whereas most people are saying, oh, you've got this referral source and then they're attaching a value to it. So it's a lot more complicated than just saying, oh, these people are referring. You actually have to look at like, well, how long is that referral source going to last? Do you have it in writing that this person is going to continue referring? Like, is your marketing attached to the brand of your practice or to yourself? Um, you know, so that I can say, okay, new clients, even though your existing clients might not want to see me because they're used to you. There's a mm. there's a funnel there that's bringing in new clients who don't know you necessarily, but they they associate with the brand of your practice. So there's a lot of other things that go into it. But then I just wanted to um, touch on, of course, as a registered business, it is more costly to maintain a registered business than a sole prop, right? So um, when you're just starting out and you don't have a lot, you 
if you, I think a lot of it, like you said, it's, it's about fear. So it's cheaper to, you know, just get started as a sole prop. So if, and, and if that's, and that's okay, if you feel that you, or you're not sure, even if you want to stay in practice, you, you're going to try this thing out, you're going to try and make it work, but you, you don't, haven't yet got that mindset that you, you can do this and you're not sure you can. So then sure you start as a sole prop and that's okay. And probably that is then the best decision. How easy is it then um, to, to make the change from sole prop to ink? If you decide, okay, I want to do this. I'm all in. I want to have an, like a formalized business. Um, my accountant says it's going to be more tax efficient for me to, to you know, register a business and pay myself a salary. How easy is it to make that change from sole prop to ink? So it's as easy as either calling your accountant and asking him to register the, the business for you or going on to CIPC and doing the registration yourself. With an ink, you need to do a MOI separate to the actual registration. So um, it's it's with, with a normal uh, PTY limited, you click a few buttons, put in some details, and you've got your registration with an ink. You need to manually complete an MOI, um, which is a memorandum of incorporation, listing all of the the details of that incorporation, but it's really not that difficult. And I understand that people is saying that it's more expensive to register, to have a registered business. Annual returns with CIPC, so you have two two um, responsibilities, which is your your CIPC and SARS. Okay, with CIPC, your annual return for a business is going to cost you if you're turning over. Under uh, the 900,000, uh, your annual return is going to cost you 100 rand. Okay. That's just to keep your business open. All you need to do is keep your business open um, with CIPC. The SARS thing, you have to do in your sell, as a sell prop in, in, as well. So it's not really more expensive than having a sell prop. Um, so, yeah, so it's very easy to change from a sole prop to a registered company it's not as easy to close that registered company so mm. i i've had a case or two where clients insisted they wanted to register a company and the company didn't work out for them and now they've got the liability of keeping that company open with cipc and keeping the source matters up to date but there's no income in that company. So they want to close the company. But in order to close, you first need to get your source tax clearance and then you need to go through a process of deregistering that company. So it okay, is very so, I think, yeah, it needs to be an informed decision yeah. as well. Yeah. So, okay. So like that is one of the major differences. As a sole prop, if you just, you can just cease to operate. You don't have to do anything if you close Yes. Off. Your business, yes. whereas a company you have to actually well, so I suppose because it's like you're creating a new life, so it's kind of like now you have to bury that life, it's a whole process <laughs> <laughs> that you have to go through. But then I think so. What you're saying is that essentially it's not so much the cost, then. Um, but what about other costs associated with uh, having a practice in terms of like certain things that you have to outsource? So, don't you need as a company to have like an annual audit or something like that? And and what about things like COID? What are some of the important things? I mean, is it the same whether you're a sole prop or a company? Do you need to register with with um, with COID and all of that stuff? What are some of the important things that one needs to be aware of? So the misconception um, is that if I'm a sole prop, I have no legal responsibility to anybody. As a sole prop, even... I mean, as a, as a, as any individual who is employing somebody. So, for example, you've got a nanny that looks after your kids at home. You are employing that person. They are working for a certain set amount of hours every month, every week. You, as an individual who does not have a, a business, who's earning a normal salary, you are responsible for that person's UIF. You are responsible and you are legally obligated to make sure that that UIF is paid over example um your legal obligation in terms of SARS uh department of labor it's exactly the same 
your legal obligation in terms of whether or not you need to be audited is the same based on your turnover. Whether or not you need to register for VAT is the same based on your turnover. A sole prop, if the turnover is more than a million rand per annum, a sole prop still needs to register for VAT. Hmm. You still need to make sure that you've got workman's compensation. Um, you still need to make sure that you're paying UIF, um, SDL, and pay as you earn if you fall in the certain categories. Everything is exactly the same. It's just that now I'm a sole prop and that is a registered business. Okay. So it, it, I think the misconception is that as a sole prop, I don't have to do anything hmm. except make money. Hmm. Which is not so, true. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is not true. Yeah. Okay. So I think there's so much that we covered and we can probably go on for another hour. But I think to end off, maybe we can just, you can just tell us now, you've said that, you know, the responsibilities are the same. So what are some of the, like you said, the main responsibilities are to SARS and then Department of Labor, if you're employing people, and then obviously if you are a registered company, then there's the CIPC that you have to maintain your, your registration. But within that, what are the most important sort of dates that um, business owners need to be aware of, especially in terms of like just managing their cash flow to know that, okay, at this time of the year, you know, as a sole prop. I have to probably pay provisional tax. So I need to be aware that I'm going to have to have money in my account to be able to pay a certain amount. What are some of the important dates you need to be aware of as a sole prop versus an ink or as both? Okay. Or both? So as a sole prop, the first, probably most important date would be your income tax return, which would be due from the 1st of July. So in a couple of weeks. Um, up until the 24th of October for this year, that is the, the deadline, the 24th of October. I know that last year they extended the deadline due to, to um, COVID lockdown restrictions and so on. And then also provisional tax is due between the 1st of July and the 23rd of June of the following year. Okay. As a registered company, you always need to take into account. So if your financial year end is February, your tax for that financial year end will be due before the end of February of the following year. So if you have your financial year end that's ended on the uh, 28th of February 2022, you are due to pay your tax before the end of next year. Also keeping in end of end of this sorry financial year also keeping in mind that you also have provisional income tax um, that you can pay during the year. Obviously as an um, as a registered company, you have provisional income tax submissions that you need to do twice in the year, and then your final income tax submission. And that is purely so that you don't have one big lump sum being paid mm -hmm. at the end of financial year. Then the very important date, if you are registered for pay as you earn UIF, all pay as you earn UIF um, submissions need to be done before the 7th of the following month. So at the end of May, we closed off our payroll and before the 7th of um, June, we need to submit and pay for that as well. Uh, basically, if you registered for VAT, you have a deadline, bi-monthly deadline of the 25th of each month. And, and that would be for the previous two months that has passed. Yeah. So those are the most important deadlines for SARS. Obviously, if you're doing customs and all of those things, which doesn't really apply unless you're importing or exporting yourselves, mm. wherever, <laughs> it doesn't really <laughs> apply to your industry. But, I mean, um, customs has its own requirements and deadlines and so on as well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we didn't even get into, like, the whole VAT story and when you need to um, register for VAT and all of that. But we'll leave that for a whole because I think that's a whole other discussion. Um, yeah. So, but I think like it's important that, like you say, people need to be aware of. And the, with the provisional tax, it's like you say, you know, you pay it begrudgingly, but it's actually better for you because, like you say, then you don't pay a lump sum. And I always advise, so I teach something called, um, there's Mike McCallowitz, I hope I'm saying his right, name right, came up with the profit first model where instead of usually you have your income minus your expenses and then you have your profit. What he does is says that, 
he first allocates what percentage of profit he takes out of his revenue before and then adjusts his expenses to make sure that he reaches his profit. And he includes in there um, tax as a separate like line item, not as part of expenses that even if you only have to pay, you don't have to pay tax this month, actually take a percentage out and put it into a savings that that is your tax so that you don't spend that money so that when the time comes, you don't have to stress that now you have to pay all this money because you've spent it already. It's sitting yeah. there in your savings ready to go to SARS, which I think is a really, um, you need to be very disciplined because the money is there and you need to spend it because you want to buy whatever assessment. Yeah. But you can't touch that money because that's SARS money, um, yeah. which I think is a nice way to kind of just have that discipline up front um, will help you, you know, down the line when you need to pay SARS. Yes. Um, so no, that's definitely, it. definitely it's very important and it's, um, it's the same like making provisions for a rainy day or a COVID pandemic or anything else. We need yeah. to, we need to, um, you know, just get used to doing that and get into the habit of, of making those provisions. And I think if COVID hasn't taught us, you know, anything, it's that we need to, we need to really consider those provisions. Um, but yeah, I hope I've, I've covered all of your questions. No, you have definitely. Thank you so much. And of course, I will put all your links and information in the description box of the video below. So if anybody is looking for a tax consultant slash accountant, or like you said, you do a lot of education and they want to reach out to you for training or anything like that, then they can just go and look in the description box and find all your information below. So thank you so much for your time and for all the information. Um, thank I'm you sure for people having find me. it very valuable. Thank you so much for having me and yeah, maybe we can do this again sometime. <laughs> definitely, definitely.